Uh, but uh, what I want to cover is integrated reporting as the next frontier. But in particular, I want to start with a bit of an explanation about what it is and what it's not, uh, because there are some misconceptions around that. Uh, I think I'll assume some level of knowledge with integrated reporting, but not, not deep. Uh, but uh, Q&A can help with that, I'm sure. So my agenda would be just to look at this question of what it is and what it's not. The distinctive contribution that integrated reporting makes in the world of corporate reporting, a term that I often use, and uh, it's can I model it? And it's, to, it's really to say to accountants, um, don't report something unless you're sure that the person receiving the report is gonna be able to use it. So I just uh, use a bit of a proxy investors and analysts and ask whether they should be able to model stuff in the integrated report. As I said, I'll introduce the Value Reporting Foundation and then I'll get a bit deeper on not just the integrated report, but also the integrated reporting process, uh, the how all of this happens. And I characterize that as an organization's integrated reporting management system. Uh, a couple of case studies that I'll point out to you and on what good might look like. Uh, I'll spend a couple of minutes on integrated reporting assurance, which is now emerging. And finally, tell you a little bit about the Deakin Integrated Reporting Center. Uh, in terms of um, the integrated reporting framework at a very high level, they're the three diagrams in the framework. And each of the diagrams is for one of the three fundamental concepts of the framework. The first being value creation for the organization and for others in the short, medium and long term. And I know that's a bit of a mouthful and I'll give you a business interpretation of that concept in a moment. The second fundamental concept is the capitals, social relationship, human, natural, intellectual, manufactured and financial. The framework is not rigid in terms of using the capitals terminology. It really suggests that organizations uh, be use the terminology that is most useful, most appropriate to them. So some talk about resources and relationships, some talk about value drivers, some talk about uh, enablers, uh, different sorts of terminology. But the key point is that this fundamental concept is encouraging organizations to think broadly about what it uses in its business to produce its outcomes. And finally, it is this how, the value creation process. So we've got the cat in the context of the external environment within which the organization operates. Uh, we start with the inputs being the capitals uh, that it has, the second diagram. And on the right-hand side, the outputs, the products and services of the organization, but also the outcomes uh, from what the organization does in terms of outcomes on each of those capitals, outcomes for the stakeholders. And in the box in the middle is where it all happens within the business model. Uh, and so that diagram is probably the most used within the framework. I think it's figure two in the framework. <clears throat> I like to actually take those, co those fundamental concepts and the language from the framework and put it into what I might call more business friendly language. And this has really come from experience in working with boards of directors, uh, chief executives and others about interpreting what integrated reporting really is. And in its simplest form, I can do it in four words. There are only three on this slide, but I can do it in four words. It's the what, the with, and the how, of the organization's business. The fourth one I add is the why, and I'll come back to why in a moment. But in terms of the what was that fundamental concept of value creation, the first picture, it's really about the purpose of the organization and its strategy. It's the what. The second piece, and this attaches to the capitals that I've just described in the framework, the resources and relationships, it's the with. It's what the organization has got to use in its business model. And the how is the value creation process, how things work in the business model and in the boardroom. And the why is the integrated thinking piece. It's the competitive edge. Why you as an organization are better at your, using your with in your how to achieve your what. And so this is uh, how the organization's integrated thinking 
is communicated with stakeholders, the integrated report being what I call a window into the quality of the organization's integrated thinking. So what it is and what it's not. In reality, integrated reporting is not a reporting initiative. It's a business initiative. Integrated thinking, integrated reporting is a process founded on integrated thinking. In my language, better business practice. Uh, it's a business initiative. It produces more benefits than just producing the integrated report. It's not about producing a new report. Many organisations use the integrated reporting framework to improve existing reports. In Australia, for example, in the operating and financial review, or in the various different forms of management commentary around the world, such as the strategic report in the UK, or the management discussion and analysis in the US, or the management report in Germany. It's critical that an integrated report is tailored to the individual organisation's own what, with and how. It's not another form of sustainability reporting. Sustainability reporting has typically been uh, uh, in relation to natural capital and social and relationship capital. Financial reporting has been mainly about financial capital and manufactured capital. The missing link has been in terms of human capital and intellectual capital and integrating reporting across all six capitals. So it's not another form of sustainability reporting. It must be investor friendly. Investors have got to be able to model it. But all stakeholders should find useful information in the integrated report for their own decision making purposes. One of the obstacles in Australia on uh, directors adopting integrated reporting were early perceptions that the integrated reporting framework re required the reporting of financial forecasts and projections. In fact, the Australian Institute of Company Directors abstained from voting on the release of the framework in 2013. But uh, we uh, actually had some very good interactions with the AICD in 2016 to explain that the, the framework does not require the reporting of financial forecasts and projections. Organisations may choose to put them in, but it's not required. What's required are forward-looking statements, the very communication of the strategy and the business model and risk and opportunity management. An integrated report in accordance with the framework must be concise. The best integrated reports are somewhere between 40 and 60 pages long because they must only have material matters in them, matters that are material to the enterprise value of the organisation. Integrated thinking at the top there, uh, and this is an area that's getting a lot of attention from the Value Reporting Foundation at the moment, uh, the definition of integrated thinking in the framework is not long or expansive. In fact, there's not a whole lot of coverage of integrated thinking uh, in uh, the framework itself. The bulk of that slide is my interpretation of what integrated thinking means in practice. And it really attaches to the what, the with, the how, and the why of the business. It's, it's how, uh, <clears throat> by focusing on the what, with, and how of the business, we bring this concept of integrated thinking to life. And what happens when an organization exercises integrated thinking is that its business performance demonstrably improves. And there are many instances around the world uh, of successful integrated reporting adopters, boards and executives saying, this improved my strategic thinking, this improved my business model. And the report is an outcome that helped investors and other stakeholders understand it. So the integrated thinking piece is the true competitive edge of the organization communicated in the integrated report, which provides a window in the quality of the organization's thinking exhibited by its what, with, how. And so in the Deakin course on integrated uh, reporting, and I know that um, there are uh, educators on this call, uh, we use a very simple simulation about uh, the trade-offs in, in buying a machine that could produce 10,000 units a day. And what the, what the case study does is we work through uh, with the lens of the capitals, what the trade-offs might be in deciding how to uh, choose either machine A or machine B. Uh, it can be done reasonably quickly by the educator just walking it through for the, the benefit of a, a webinar, or it can be done as a real life example by the students in the room. Uh, and I think that uh, Luck Meeker is on this call and he particularly has done this very well uh, with our integrated reporting students at, at Deakin University. So the outcome, uh, is drawn out 
uh, through introducing various new assumptions as we work through the different lenses of the capitals. So we have machine A versus machine B, one costing half the other. Uh, and what that has meant in terms of manufactured capital and breakdowns, uh, who's got the best safety record, machine A or machine B? Uh, what about usage of energy in the production of machine A and machine B? Some differences there. And what's it mean in terms of the in terms of society at large? And so just an analysis working through the capital's lens of how you might make these sort of decisions and reflect on the trade-offs involved. So integrated reporting is ultimately a shift away from traditional reporting. The new mindset of integrated thinking. Uh, and that definition on the slide is simply the one that I've already shown you. The second thing is the new process of integrated reporting. It's not just about the report. It's about how you get reporting done. Uh, and so integrated reporting is a process. Inter integrated report is the outcome. And the integrated report is a concise communication about how the organization's strategy, governance, business model, performance, and prospects in the context of the external environment lead to the creation of enterprise value in the short, medium, and long term. The distinctive contribution of integrated reporting. And I wanted to leave this slide until I'd done that introduction to the framework and the business interpretations, because these things should be uh, becoming apparent to you now. Integrated reporting framework is the only reporting framework grounded, founded on integrated thinking or better business practice. That's this point of the business benefits of pursuing integrated reporting. A distinctive contribution is the foundational description of the business, which is at the heart of the integrated report. A foundational description of it's what, with, how, and why. It's multiple capitals lens. Uh, exhibited by the, um, the case study simulation that I just spoke to. It's about all resources and relationships, not just financial resources. Critically important in an integrated report is the basis of preparation and presentation. And I suggest that you have a look at paragraph 4.40 and 4.41 of the framework on this point. Because unlike in financial reporting, where I, I'm, I'm not sure we really even need uh, <clears throat> Uh, basis of preparation notes, except to say that we complied with IFRS uh, and how we made particular accounting policy choices, or in uh, a sustainability report using SASB or GRI standards, you can just say you complied. But in an integrated report, it's more than that. You've got to have a very strong basis for the metrics that you've chosen to report, to report on the performance and prospects of the business. And yes, they can be drawn from IFRS or US GAAP. And yes, they can be drawn from SASB and GRI standards, but there will inevitably be business critical metrics, which are not required by standards, which are essential in the integrated report, particularly in relation to intangibles, intellectual capital and human capital. And so this basis of preparation and presentation is a very, very important part of the integrated report. Uh, but also in terms of the distinctive contribution, it's not only the report, it's about the reporting and how, how the reporting is done. And in fact, because this is a description of the business, it's not just about the reporting. It's actually about the business management controls over strategic management, governance in the boardroom, which underlie the integrated report. <clears throat> terminology, as I said, uh, watch out for the terminology. The capital's terminology is not, uh, <clears throat> is not required. What, with, how, why? is Michael language, it's not in the framework. Uh, we often hear this distinction between financial and non-financial. I won't use the term non-financial because everything in the end has got a financial consequence. I, I prefer the term pre-financial because if you're thinking about the long-term, uh, everything is gonna have an impact on enterprise value in the long-term. So there'll probably be other terminology things that you come across um, and for that, I suggest the framework, it's got a good glossary, but also the uh, resources on the Value Reporting Foundation website. Uh, this Can I Model It fo focus, I suggest that one of the ways that you might teach this is to get people to say, look, we know that um, employees and customers and others out there in society don't necessarily use uh, DCF models. Uh, not all investors do, but it's a pretty good proxy to think about how uh, and the information in the integrated report could be used by an investor to strengthen its DCF model 
in projecting its view of the enterprise value of the organization. So the purpose of this slide is to show how you could map an integrated report to a DCF model at a high level as a proxy for an investor, can I model it? A quick introduction of the Value Reporting Foundation. It's all of uh, four weeks old now, formed on the 9th of, of, uh, of June, but uh, we've been working together since uh, basically November of last year. There are three principal resources of the Value Reporting Foundation. The first is the Integrated Thinking Principles. The second is the Integrated Reporting Framework, which I've focused on. And the third is the SASB Standards. Uh, and the, the three resources in the Value Reporting Foundation has come together because of where we are in the world. And that, uh, that slide is to just meant to draw out a few of the things that are in the world today, which have led to the creation of the Value Reporting Foundation. Concepts of sustainability and intangible value growing in importance. Ocean Tomo Research, 90% of the S&P 500's market capital, capitalization today is not on financial balance sheets, not on financial reporting balance sheets, 90%. Uh, why did we merge? Because there's so much out there. There were thought to be around 400 competing reporting frameworks in the world. And so there was a need for rationalizing them, simplifying things and integrating our resources and relationships. In terms of the convergence of corporate reporting that's happening in the world, that's a key driver for the formation of the Value Reporting Foundation. So we are one global organization with a unified strategy and those three principal resources. We are in the middle of simplifying the corporate reporting landscape. And we do provide active support to the ambition of this global international sustainability standards board, which is expected to be announced at the COP26 conference in Glasgow in November of this year. Strategic goals of the Value Reporting Foundation. I'm happy that you, you have a, a copy of these slides if you would like it. I will let you read them in due course at your own leisure. I've mentioned the three resource, principal resources that we have. This one is really important. Uh, the so-called group of five um, standard setters and framework providers in the course of the second half of this year, last year came up with a paper uh, to demonstrate to the IFRS Foundation how these standards um, fit together. The term that's often used now is interoperability. So in terms of the smallest of the boxes in the middle, that's the box of financial reporting, IFRS if you like. The second box is where SASB standards play, SASB being sustainability standards for investors and the integrated reporting framework being the thing that integrates those two. The outer box is the broader society uh, considerations, and that's where the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, plays. So it's very clear to us, uh, and we are working a lot on it, of how these things, the interoperability of the integrated reporting framework, IFRS, SASB standards, and GRI standards. One of my, my, my diagrams, which is where I bring together integrated reporting process, I put reporting strategy at the, at the middle. I believe it's really important for an organization to have a reporting strategy, whereby its board and its management team defines what it wants to report to who, in what format, through what distribution channels, when, and most importantly, why. How is the business story going to be told? Because integrated reporting is not a mandated thing. It's not required. It must be a strategic thing based on a business case, a return on investment for particular organizations. So in this slide, the top half of the diagram shows the what. It's the reports, it's the reports portfolio with, with a visual of the integrated report being the flagship corporate report. Technological linkages to the other reports in the portfolio, the financial report, the sustainability report and so on. And the bottom half of the diagram being the how, how this gets done, how the reporting strategy gets put into practice by way of the reporting process, the reporting team, and the reporting technology. This is where the real action in integrated reporting is, bringing it to life. And so an integrated reporting management system is quite different to a financial reporting management system than a sustainability reporting management system. And that, that, and that is a definition of what this system is about. Uh, in terms of the differences to, between 
the integrated reporting management system, the financial reporting system and sustainability reporting system, this slide tries to map that at a very high level. So for example, the three fundamental concepts of integration across the six capitals, the yeah, IFRS has got a conceptual framework as well, but it's really focused on financial capital in particular. Um, there, is a, there is a conceptual framework for the SASB standards, which I should mention. <clears throat> and so uh, you can map and contrast the differences in these systems. The reporting strategy, I won't go into a detail on this one, but that's, that's a facilitation tool that I use to ask to help organisations think about their reporting strategies. What is the real story? Who are you telling it to? Is it being told at the right time? Is the format right for the format that stakeholders make decisions with? Uh, does the report engender confidence and trust in the report and the organisation? So in that context, what is the reporting strategy and how is it implemented? A few uh, uh, snapshots. I'm not suggesting that AGL is the, the best integrated report in the world. It's not but it's a good one and it illustrates some concepts from integrated reporting, AGL being one of the top two listed energy companies in Australia. So I really like the about this report in the inside front cover of the AGL integrated report because what they do is they explain how they've used integrated reporting as their, the framework as their flagship, but they've also used SASB standards and GRI standards and they've actually put their detailed sustainability information on a microsite where people can go for more information. I just like the way that they've described their, uh, their, their approach to reporting, but also on the right-hand side, they don't say the capitals, they say they're business value drivers, and they reconcile this to the, SD, the sustainable development goals. That's a good way of doing it. Uh, AGL talk about its what, its purpose, values, and strategy. Um, few two words, many words for my liking, but it's pretty good. Uh, in terms of what they do. Uh, and part of what they do, of course, is the operating environment in which they operate. And what they do here is they bring out, bring out their strategic risks and opportunities. Uh, in terms of uh, the risks and opportunities, they actually do a great job at connecting the individual risks across into the relevant business, uh, the, the value driver, their capitals. So I think that connectivity done visually through those little icons on there is, is very good. And they also link or connect uh, their risks into the stakeholder issues that uh, come from the way that they interact with their stakeholders in the environment. Uh, the business model of AGL, that is not the best business model diagram in the world, but it's not a bad one. And it traits as a fairly complex business of AGL, which is working from energy generation through to energy retailing on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, they link back that back to the value drivers. And just as I did machine A and machine B, that's where AGL brings that sort of concept to get to, to life in its own business. Uh, too wordy for me, but they get into their customers as a key part of the social relationship capital of the organization. And again, there's this good connectivity into the KPIs around customer satisfaction. Uh, and they have a, a governance summary. It's really important that an integrated report just doesn't name the board of directors. It actually says what the board of directors does, what the board of directors KPIs are and how they've contributed to enterprise value. And so that's what AGL is doing in its, in its governance summary. Uh, and then in terms of the, uh, the value creation process, uh, I've now moved off AGL. And this one is an organization called Dexus. I think that's probably a better value creation diagram than AGLs. Because it shows the mega trends, maps that to the strategy, the what, comes across into the key resources, the capitals, puts that into the business model, and then maps across the KPIs, which measure uh, the outcomes and the out outputs. There's another one, Virgin Money, if you like that, as a, as a way of looking at it, or CSL as a way of doing a, a value creation diagram. Uh, and so I just then wanted to move to a couple of minutes on assurance because we've now got the emergence of integrated reporting assurance. There are seven instances in the world of integrated reporting assurance as we sit here today. Uh, and the icons of the companies on the left are the organizations that have obt obtained integrated reporting assurance. The pioneer was ABN AMRO, the Dutch merchant bank e by EY. The second was the IRC itself by Crow, 
uh, <coughs> a medium-sized accounting firm. Uh, I led on the third and fourth, both here in Melbourne, uh, CBUS, the pension fund, and uh, CPA Australia, the accounting body. Uh, <coughs> they were the third and fourth instances. The fifth was in India for a, a pharma company called Sipla. The sixth was actually in Malaysia by Petronas Chemicals, again by KPMG. The last instance that I'm aware of is in Sri Lanka, SoftLogic, a life insurance company. And the IAASB has now put out guidance on the mainstreaming of integrated reporting assurance in its external, extended external reporting assurance guidance paper. On the right-hand side, and I'd encourage you to read this, is a paper that the IRC put out with IFAC in April of this year. And it's really about throwing out the challenge to the corporate reporting world about how to obtain integrated reporting assurance. So on the left-hand side of these six instances, limited assurance of the integrated report, we believe that the end game in terms of assurance should be reasonable assurance of the integrated report. No one's got there yet, although AB and AMRO are starting to get close. I'd encourage you to read it. It's an easy read. It's only five pages and it's on the websites. So I was going to say that the distinctive contribution of integrated reporting leads directly to the unique opportunities and challenges of integrated reporting assurance. And assurance, it's different because what you're doing is assuring investors that the organization has faithfully described its business model, its strategy, its approach to government, governance to its investors, much different to procedures around uh, gathering uh, measurement-based evidence on metrics. It's about evaluation. It's about evaluation of the narrative description of the business. It's about evaluation of the basis and preparation, preparation and presentation. It's a, about evaluation of the design and operating, operation of the integrated reporting process, which is reported on in the report. And so that's the main diagram in this paper on assurance that uh, I do suggest that you have a, a read of. No time to go into that in any detail today. And then finally, to the Deakin Integrated Reporting Centre. There are three pillars to the strategic plan. The first is in relation to research. The second is in relation to teaching. And the third is in relation to industry engagement and thought leadership. In terms of research, we think we're doing something uh, unique in terms of uh, research um, <clears throat> to produce a, a unique universal measure of integrated reporting quality that can be used around the world for different purposes, e.g. by the Value Reporting Foundation in supporting adoption statistics, e.g. by a firm like KPMG to support its research on what happens in particular countries, e.g. by academics just as you uh, to back academic research on integrated reporting quality and adoption. Uh, Professor Peter Carey is leading on that uh, work along with uh, Michael Wang and Professor Roger Simnett is involved in that work. In terms of teaching, uh, we've been teaching integrated reporting now for a number of years at Deakin and I'll just show you what the course looks like in a moment. Uh, but in, where I particularly lead is on industry engagement thought leadership and that's in, engaging uh, <clears throat> Deakin's integrated reporting centre with organisations such as the Australian Financial Reporting Council and other organisations in the Australian value, value of corporate reporting value chain. Uh, we are working with international universities and we're closely working closely with the value reporting itself and its academic network. <clears throat> so the course at Deakin, that's it on one page, 11, 10 or 11 seminars run over a, a, a period of weeks, starting out on the left-hand side, introducing people to the world of integrated reporting, introducing them to the integrated reporting framework, and then drilling down into it. But particularly the integrated thinking uh, aspects of this, as it is about better business practice. So seminar two on value creation, seminar three on the capitals, seminar four on the value creation process fundamental concept. Wrapped, in, wrapped around it is the integrated thinking piece, creating value over time. We then move on to the integrated reporting management system, uh, how do we prepare the reports? How do we get all this done and implementing the integrated reporting management system? So there's a number of seminars on that, concluding with assurance. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and see if there's any questions or, or observations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Michael? That was an uh, excellent presentation. Is there anyone that like to comment 
Any observation? Any question? I'd like to also welcome Professor Peter Carey. I just, uh, I know that he's here. Um, I guess we can always uh, ask the question through chat if you have any questions yeah. as we continue. Um, someone said something? Oh, just me, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so um, if you have any question, please uh, send in the chat. Then we'll move on to the next session. I think okay. someone just asked a, a question. Um, okay. Um, in the chat, a few, like two questions in the chat. Um, how do, from Mr. Um, Razak, how do companies determine the materiality matters? Yeah, uh, the, fr the fr framework is really good on materiality. Uh, the definition of materiality is different to the definition of financial reporting materiality and sustainability reporting materiality. <clears throat> a matter is material if it could substantively affect the ability of the entity to create enterprise value in the short, medium and long term. So it's not about um, calculating uh, effects on financial reporting profit. It's about really thinking about whether something is material to the purpose, strategy, business model and governance of organisation. If it is, it goes in. And the framework is also very good at talking about the materiality determination process in bringing together the various strands of consideration of what might be material, looking at the external environment, what comes from that, uh, asking stakeholders what they think and getting their perspectives and bringing all, that, all this together in a filtration mechanism, uh, having regard to what the organisation is doing itself and working out what's material to enterprise value creation. I use the Cano model at Lens. Would something... Would, if I reported something, would it probably impact on investor decision making? That's material. Someone asked, uh, could you please, uh, from Mr. Mohammed Shah, could you please elaborate a little bit more on teaching going beyond accounting? Yeah, I think I think that's beginning. probably our next um, our next frontier. Uh, we, the centre is within the accounting department, but I think you've probably uh, <coughs> realised through this session with the integrative thinking piece that this is, this is not just about accounting. This is about business. Uh, and this has got, this needs, it's about strategy. Uh, it's about what people do in MBAs. Uh, and it's not even just about uh, the Faculty of Business and Law. Uh, it's, it's about... Uh, depending on the particular industry and business that we're talking about, uh, we could be anywhere within the university. So what we're really focused on is just putting the value proposition out there around the various faculties of the university to see if there's interest. And there is, but it takes a little bit of time to get that level of appreciation across. Okay. I'm just reading the chat, scrolling. Um, Mr. Oh, hang on. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Devesh said um, he really liked the presentation. Um, that's nice. Um, oh, good. <laughs> uh, from, excuse my pronunciation, Marishan Leonor yep. Obon. Um, is there any reference for disclosure specific I'm, for each? I'm, just, yeah, I'm very each happy group. that I'm answering this question uh, today and not two months ago. Uh, because for the I IRC, <clears throat> uh, we did not have industry-specific things. SASB does. SASB is all about metrics, all about sustainability metrics, and SASB has an industry taxonomy for 77 industries. So that's what SASB is all about. Tailored sustainability metrics uh, for particular industries of importance. And what the Value Reporting Foundation is about is about using SASB standards to strengthen integrated reports in accordance with the framework. And um, the last question that's uh, on here right now, 
um, do from Mr. Abdul Razak, do the companies have to prepare separate statements for sustainability and integrated reporting? No, integrated, the integrated reporting framework is not mandatory and it's never expected to be. Uh, and in most places, sustainability reporting is still voluntary. But I think that's changing. <clears throat> I think that um, in countries such as New Zealand, I mean, New Zealand's about to mandate a, a climate reporting standard. The, and the point that we make is that, okay, if there's mandates, we'll, we'll live with them. We'll probably end up having one here in Australia. But the way to do it is to put the reporting on sustainability matters, SASB metrics, in the strategic business context of the integrated report. That's the important thing. Anissa, go ahead. Um, I think, um, unless, oh, there's, do we have time for one more? Uh, do you reckon? Yes. Uh, okay. I can see the, I'm reading the question, and, and the answer is there's even more of a case for integrated reporting in companies that have experienced setbacks or losses. <clears throat> because it's, it's, it's a basis to explain what they're doing, what the response is. If you look at the AGL, uh, integrated report. AGL has got a lot, lot of coal fired power generation and it's, it's not going away overnight tonight. Uh, so they're, they're, they're using integrated reporting to explain what they're doing by way of these trade-offs. Um, there's a number of organisations that have, around the world that have actually used the integrated report as their primary response um, to um, something that's happened. Uh, for example, CBA, the CBA Bank in Australia, after the Hain Royal Commission, uh, it really strengthened its what it called its uh, strategic report uh, to explain not just we recognise we had a problem, but here's what we're doing about it. I, I really like that question for, from uh, Yanuar. Um, yeah, you know, company experiencing setback and losses also need to make the integrated reporting. Um, so I guess the answer from Michael was really very, very good. Uh, it's, it's not about the, 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 the result. I think it's also about the thinking behind it and what they're going to do about it. And it's yeah. expressed in integrated reporting. So this is excellent. Okay. Abdi, on that one, that, one that often comes up there, Abdi, is, oh, is this just for big listed companies? <clears throat> and the, the answer is no. Uh, some of the best ap applications are actually in SMEs or the public sector or member-based organizations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Uh, uh, Michael, do you foresee any country that will eventually uh, make it mandatory or not? Uh, yeah, South Africa already has. Um, Japan, uh, most, most countries around the world are, good, are doing it through their corporate governance codes. If, okay. not, if not, why not? Uh, and <clears throat> Australia is one of them. Uh, the new recommendation 4.3 of the ASX corporate governance uh, principles and recommendation has just come into effect. And, and over the course of the next <clears throat> uh, few weeks, we will say, see companies making their first 4.3 adoption statements. And what 4.3 says is that directors must report on an if not, why not basis, the processes that they put into place to ensure the integrity of all of their corporate reports, all of their corporate reports including operating and financial reviews, including integrated reports, including sustainability reports. So they must, that is mandatory. They must report whether they have or they have not. Uh, and they, they, the recommendation puts a particular spotlight on instances where a, a particular corporate report has not been audited or, or reviewed by an external auditor. Wow, this is really great. I mean, I think this will really, uh, uh, um, really um, put Put some pressure on companies to to start uh, looking at uh, you know more more than just the financial results and and also put into a lot of um, you know integrated thinking as you said uh, many many angles sustainability and so on so I I think it's very very responsible for a company to to adopt this yeah okay Anissa. <laughs> um. Thank you again, Mr. Michael, um, for presenting on IR and um, drive, the drivers of business value creation over time and also strategic um, reporting, I guess. 